particular global conference, which I see has a galaxy of very eminent speakers like my guru, Dr. C. Rangarajan, Professor Swaminathan, and other stalwarts who are going to deliberate on this very challenging subject. I have been asked to discuss inclusive banking from financial inclusion to financial deepening. This is an issue which not only concerns us, but one which deeply interests and engages every thinking person in this country. Because this is the one ingredient which will take the country far forward. Financial inclusion is not new. It has formed the core of our policy commitments. But then we must understand that this is an increasingly difficult area. It's, it's very important but very complex. So it does not offer simple solutions. In a country we, where nearly 50% of people are still not able to access financial products and services, Credit cards are confined to the creamy layer, to very few. Insurance is severely under financial inclusion is defined by the RBI as the process of ensuring access to appropriate financial products and services needed by all sections of the society in general and vulnerable groups such as weaker sections, women and low income groups in particular at an affordable cost, in a fair and transparent manner, through mainstream institutional players. What is the RBI's approach to financial inclusion? We have followed a planned and structured approach to address the twin issues of demand and supply. We have framed regulations with an objective of providing banking services to 6 lakh plus villages and to create an enabling environment for banks to do so. We are furthering financial inclusion in a mission mode through a combination of strategies ranging from relaxation of regulatory guidelines, provision of new products and supportive measures to achieve sustainable and scalable financial inclusion. Keeping in view the infrastructure prevailing in our country, that is 46 domestic scheduled commercial banks, 61 RRBs are 51 RRBs after amalgamation. We have a cooperative banks, urban cooperative banks, regional rural corporate banks. We have adopted a bank-led model. We are often questioned on this. So I hasten to add that we are completely model neutral. We are more comfortable with a bank-led model as banks are regulated, supervised by us, and because banks are under the Deposit Insurance Credit Guarantee Corporation, so the depositors' interests are protected at least up to 1 lakh, which is an amount we feel covers the vulnerable sections which we are targeting. Now you must understand that countries like Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Kenya had no banking structure in place. For them, it is a twofold choice. Either they start from scratch and build banking structures, brick and mortar banks, or they build a digital network. Now, digital network is ideal. We will also try to move towards it. But we are model neutral at the moment. We feel we can leverage the penetrative outreach and strength of our banking system. And going forward, we can also get into the information autobahn, which is de definitely required. So, we are furthering financial inclusion in a mission mode through a combination of strategies, and we want to move very fast in this area. Our financial initiatives are ICT enabled, wherein doorstep banking services will be provided using handheld devices such as POS machines point-of-sale machines, mobile phones, etc., which ride on delivery models developed by banks to best suit their requirements. Other players, such as mobile companies, corporates, etc., are also allowed to partner with banks in offering services collaboratively. 
Some of the banks have told us that they are working with major telecom service providers like Airtel, Vodafone, Idea, Tata Teleservices, etc., who work as business correspondents, leverage upon their retail network to extend the banking services. Going forward, this is going to become increasingly more important. Under the institutional mechanism put in place for financial inclusion, we have the Financial Stability and Development Council, which has an exclusive mandate for financial inclusion and financial literacy, a separate technical group on financial, uh, financial literacy is a very important adjunct for promoting financial inclusion, consumer protection, and ultimately financial stability. RBI has adopted an integrated approach where efforts towards financial inclusion and financial literacy go hand in hand. Apart from the initiatives taken by the Reserve Bank of India towards tackling the supply side issues, and I mentioned that uh, in the FSDC, we have a separate committee which is headed by the deputy governor and, uh, it, uh, it, and we also have a financial inclusion advisory committee. Now this is a very important committee and we assign a lot of value to the inputs we receive from the financial inclusion advisory committee because we have representatives of civil society and people who are actually working at the grassroots in this committee. And then uh, we have a committee, and, and this is also under the chairmanship of the deputy governor. At the state level, we have state level bankers committees. Then uh, below the state, we have the district level committees where the lead bank officers, and below that, the lead bank officers. Now that we have, we are one of the few countries, I think there are only 34 countries in the world, which have adopted what is called a national strategy for financial education. We have done this, and we have done this under the ages of the FSDC to address all the demand side issues arising in financial literacy. This strategy seeks to create awareness about formal financial services, impart knowledge about various products, and seek to convert this knowledge into behavior with the objective of linking the illiterate, unbanked population with the financial system. So first we are trying to create an absorption capacity by stimulating the demand side and then for the supply side we will meet these demands. Further, we are focusing on financial, we are starting young and we are not alone in doing this. All central banks across the world are doing this because after the great financial crisis there is an increasing realization that you see that People who were given loans were no income, no job. They were called ninja. This ninja had no idea of the terms of the contracts they were signing. So as long as the uh, cycle was going up and the loans could be availed of very easily, liquidity was very light, interest rates were low, liquidity was easy, it was very simple. They could pay back their mortgages. But the minute there was a liquidity tightening and the ferris wheel stopped, they were literally left hanging in the air. And that is why I like the image of the ferris wheel because see what it did to the world economy, it nearly brought everything crashing about our ears. And that is why for financial literacy, we are now talking to youngsters, school children, and are, and are standardizing national curriculum setting bodies, working with them, to integrate financial literacy into the existing course curriculum. We are trying, now what have we done? What have been the special initiatives of the RBI? Because we say we are committed to financial inclusion, we are part of financial inclusion. So what we have done is, we have relaxed branch authorization. We have freed bank branching completely, but we say that 25% uh, of all bank branches must, and I repeat, must be opened in unbanked, underpenetrated rural centers. Otherwise, bank branching is free, and you do not have to come to the Reserve Bank of India. As broadly includes self set targets in respect to rural brick and mortar branches open, business correspondence employed, coverage of unbanked villages, 
with population of less than above 2,000. Now there is no population criteria. All villages must be covered. Then we say, uh, we ask the banks, how many Kisan credit cards issued? How many general credit card issues? You report to us on a monthly basis. We consolidate data on a quarterly basis. And on a yearly basis, with our deputy governor and the chair, Dr. Chakravarti, we review how far you have gone. And we, we see your shortcomings, and we try to work together as to how can we plug the difficulties arising. The important thing is that these financial inclusion plans are board approved. They are meshed with the corporate and business plans of the banks. So the banks have necessarily to do this. And we review. Now I am telling you this so confidently because I can tell you that since the last period, that is the projections of 10 to 13, year 10 to year 13 show me that nearly 2,68,000 banking outlets have been set up as of March 13, as against 67,694 banking outlets in March 2010. So see, we have traveled the distance from 67,694 to 2,68,000 banking outlets. 7,400 7, rural bank branches have been opened during this three-year period in unbanked areas. 109 million basic savings bank deposit accounts have been added, taking the total number of basic savings bank deposit accounts to 182 million. The share of ICT-based accounts has increased substantially. Percentage of ICT accounts to total banking, basic banking accounts has increased from 25% in March 10 to 45% in March 13. With the addition of nearly 9.48 million farm sector households during the period, 33.8 million households have been provided with small entrepreneurial credit, credit as at the end of March 13. With the addition of nearly 2.25 million non-farm sector households during this period, 3.6 million households, three all entrepreneurial credit, as at the end of March the period. Now we come to the projected financial inclusion plan for the period 2000 access to banking services in the remaining large unbanked areas of the country. Banks have been advised to draw up a fresh three-year financial inclusion plan for the period 2013 to 16. Banks have also been advised to ensure that the financial inclusion plans which are prepared by them do not remain lost in their corporate folders. These plans must be disaggregated right down to the bank branch level. The focus under the new financial inclusion plan is now more towards increasing usage or financial deepening, increasing the volume of transactions, especially in the BC ICT accounts, by increasing the flow of products to the small value customers. Now, in this, financial literacy becomes very, very important. So we have said that, you know, all the financial literacy centers, and we've already set up around 700 million of these linked to the bank branches in March 2013. These FLCs have educated 2.2 million people through various literacy programs in the last one year. Banks have been further advised to scale up financial, liter financial literacy efforts and conduct outdoor financial literacy camp once in a month. We have standardized the curriculum of this, so each bank does not show different things. We have got a set of 16 interrelated posters through which in very simple language we try to tell the common person why should he save, what is a rainy day, why at all should he save with a bank. And why? What is? And we have give, and we then give a financial diary to him, where he can record what are his essential expenses and what are his inessential expenses. And we convey very simple messages. We say, okay, how many cups of tea do you drink? You drink six. Drink four. Of those two, you can save the money, and you can have a financial goal. You save for a house. You save for your life cycle needs, marriages, debts, and slowly you will find how your money will accumulate in the bank. 
what we say is that the poorest person can save, everybody needs to save from the poorest to the richest. And if you save in a bank, you earn interest. If you take credit from a bank, you get a loan easily. If you take credit from a money lender, yes, you get the loan more easily. But then you are paying much more for that loan than you pay in a bank. So very simply, we try to explain to them the concept of annualized interest and the concept of immediate recurring interest. We are also following these new bank licensing policies and we have told the private banks also that this is essential for you to do. It is also very, very necessary. Now, all this is what we have done, but we are also facing severe challenges. We have challenges of not having built up a business case. With Aadhaar, with the direct benefit transfer system, we will get a business case. Once we get a business case, the efficient delivery model will follow. Because then it will be very clear how you can scope funds from the bottom of the pyramid, which will be a stable source of funding for the banks. Then we are also saying that all the applicants, you know, now we are issuing, going to issue new bank licenses. I, I want to stress this because this is very important for all of you to understand that we are saying that applicants for new bank licenses will be, if applications are being evaluated on their track record in financial inclusion and if they do not have an existing track record, what is the projection which they are going to do? How are they going to do financial inclusion? How will they, the new banks which are coming up, how will they penetrate to the rural areas? This is very, very critical. Now, see the viability of the BC model and technology related issues are also there. So while nearly 2.70 lakh banking outlets are available across the country, the number of transactions are not increasing proportionately. Now, this is something which really worries and concerns me because this reduces viability and impacts the scalability of the model. There are issues also with the digital connectivity, which there will be in our country. This coupled with delays in issuance of smart, smart cards by the service providers leads to severe credibility issues in hardware infrastructure a broad overview of where we stand and what we try to do with financial inclusion. Now let me come to a few questions. The first of these many questions which I know would be agitating you is, why this bank led model? Why do we have a bank led model? So for three reasons. Firstly, Bank deposits are guaranteed by the Deposit Insurance Corporation and we feel that the depositor's money will remain safe and secure. Secondly, consider that we are dealing with clientele which has never used financial products and services from a bank. And therefore, for them, it is very important for us to ensure safety of their funds. Because banks are regulated and well capitalized issues, this is the second reason, they are subject to RBI's direct control, exercised through the processes of supervision and on-site and off-site inspection and regulation. This regulation is aimed at protecting the depositors' interests, orderly development and conduct of banking operations, and fostering of the overall health of the financial and banking system. Thirdly, and most importantly, we have huge penetrative outreach to these 87 commercial banks who have 72,116 branches, 20 private sector banks with 13,482 branches, 41 foreign banks, 331 branches, and representative offices. So we have the banking infrastructure and architecture in place, which we can successfully quadruple by linking with the business correspondent body and leveraging IT. However, I hasten to add, today we have a bank-led model. We need not, uh, let me just say we are model neutral and we have substantially relaxed extant regulation and regulatory mandates. Had we not done so, we would not have been able at all 
to cover the distance which we have covered so far. You see, I have already discussed with you the introduction of the basic bank account, the liberalization of the KYC, the introduction of the business correspondent, and now the acceptance of the EKYC and the compulsory branching into these unbanked areas. That is 25% of the bank licenses must be opened there, and the new bank license applicants and the imperative of financial inclusion which they have to embrace. Now what? Now let us come to products and services. I accept that it is a weakness that so far we have not been able to have products and services which are customized to the needs of the poor borrower and linked to his income streams. This is an area where we will have to innovate. Now gradually we have in, enlarged the number of people who can be the business correspondents. Initially, it was just the individuals who were appointed by the banks. Then we said, all right, we will have non-profit section 25 companies appointed by the banks. Then we went further. We said, yes, we can have corporates also appointed by the banks. Now we have said that, all right, funds collected, that is, funds collected by non-bank prepaid account providers, bank in escrow account held in our regulated banks with funds in these accounts isolated from the non-bank companies, you know what, core business. This can be done as long as you open this escrow account and isolate these funds from the work which you do. This is essential and non-bank entities can, subject to this proviso, we allow them to issue semi-closed prepaid instruments. We have indeed prescribed transaction limits, but gradually we, you will notice that we have been increasing these limits. See, there are two kinds of things which we have to bridge. First, we have to bridge the fear of voluntary exclusion by increasing financial literacy. Voluntary exclusion occurs and imposes costs on households and families. The unbanked are cut off due to fear of price barriers, the cost of services, the need to frequently visit bank branches, foregoing days minimum wages, and then there are non-price barriers. Besides the distance from the bank branch, which I have already spoken of, also include endless paperwork, endless documentations, restrictions on address, lack of KYC, refined address, clear income stream, etc. So far, we have been focusing on these areas and try to work around this. Bank the unbanked is our principal slogan. Bank the unbanked. Once we surmount this, we will approach the digital divide. We do accept that till providers of services take the digital payments grid into the unpenetrated areas, poor and rural communities will remain entrenched in the cash economy or the penny economy. Now, this will be a very big wedge between India and Bharat, which clearly we don't want. So, what will happen will be that the cost of service provision to this and to the poor entities will remain a challenge as opposed to the ease of transaction through electronic mode. So, banks, insurance companies, utility providers will all find it cheaper to do business when there is digital connectivity. So this will be the second huge step which we will have to take beyond what we have done so far. Because we do not want, we want India and Bharat to be on one, on one frame. We don't want them, we do not want this increasing divide. Financial inclusion alone can pave way for this unification. Financial inclusion also allows the regulator to monitor all transactions which enter the formal economy rather than remain untraceable in the informal economy. Digital payments lead to a digital audit trail which will further enable this. I also want to share with, share with you that international standard setting bodies like the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, and the Financial Inclusion Task Force are putting guidelines in place 
to further expand access. So far, in the way forward, if we have to attain financial healing, we have to address a few challenges. All the six lakh villages in the country must be covered, which are uncovered. Focus has to be on increasing the rural branches and opening accounts of all eligible individuals in the country. There are challenges of the BC model. Right now, the BC model is not being scaled up because we are confining the BC, we say that you first deposit 50,000. Now this 50,000 alone is going to be the limit on which you are going to operate. This is fine, it works, but it cannot be scaled up. After all, we don't tell the bank cashier that today I'm just giving you 5,000 rupees, work with this. So similarly, we have to think a bit along these lines. Secondly, a steady revenue stream has to be there. After all, if this is the only work he's going to be doing, he also needs to get a remuneration. And the customer service points, the providers, the PC aggregators have to ensure that all the revenue, they do not keep all the revenue with them, they also part it to the field on the street BC, because otherwise this becomes a problem. Now, if you are availing services from the BC, are you only the client of the BC or the client of the bank? You are the client of the bank. So what happens if the BC does not have cash or is not able to come? With the card which the BC has given you, you should be able to go to the nearest bank branch and do your transaction over there. Secondly, if there is a technological glitch in the machine, again you should be able to go to the bank branch. And the glitch should also be easily resolved. So the BC aggregator has to address all these issues also. Then, supervision of the BC, I have also stressed, is very necessary and that is why we have issued the clear guidelines. Because once again I am repeating that the reputation risk is entirely of the bank. Now, as regards the transactions, these must increase. So, if you have to have financial deepening, if you want to have real financial inclusion, not paper inclusion, so you have to leverage on the direct benefit transfer implementation, you have to ride on the Aadhaar card, you have to experiment with innovation, you have to customize, have bespoke products, you have to give hassle-free emergency credit, just like you give the automatic overdraft, and issue the entrepreneurial cards. Then, to increase it from the demand side, financial literacy is essential. Financial for that, the National Strategy on Financial Education, National Center for Financial Education, and inclusion of financial education in school curriculum become very important. So these are the challenges which will come in the way for financial deepening. You see, Affordable financial services delivery is something which the banks must grapple with. Today, a chance to increase business opportunities by widening access to affordable financial services to those at the bottom of the pyramid presents itself before banks. People with low incomes typically require loans with short settlement cycles. These are hard to find. And those, these loans with short settlement cycles are very easily available. You see, the, the mistake which we make is, we say that you are not getting financial services from mainstream service provider. You are getting financial services, but the poor person is getting them at a prohibitive cost. He gets financial services. He admits, he tells a man to take the money to his village, but that man can come back and say, I lost the money. That man can charge 200 rupees extra. That man can give the money, but give 15 days later. But a remittance will be immediate. He will give the money, money will be in the hands of his wife or mother at the same time. So now, money lenders are prohibitively expensive and financial literacy and education will enable people to draw this distinction. This will be a short step, but a big step for the banks to offer customized and affordable financial services to the poor linked to needs and income streams. For banks, this will be a niche clientele. For borrowers, it will be an affordable legal option to transact through a bank and a first step to avoid the cycle of perennial debt and perpetual poverty 
in which they find themselves trapped. The banking industry has shown tremendous growth in volume and complexity during the last few decades. Despite significant improvements in all the areas relating to financial viability and competitiveness, I have serious concerns that we have not been able to resolve the access usage conundrum. There is access but insufficient usage of accounts and banking services and facilities. Banks have as yet not succeeded in including vast segments of the population, especially the underprivileged sections of society, into the fold of banking services. Internationally too, efforts are being made to study the causes of financial exclusion as financial inclusion in the post-global crisis world has acquired a very sharp salience. Meager assets, inaccessible markets, scarce job opportunities lock people into material poverty, which is why promoting opportunity by stimulating economic growth, ensuring financial inclusion, making financial systems and financial markets work better for poor people, and building up their assets is the real key to poverty reduction. Unrestrained access to public goods and services is the sine qua non of an open and efficient society. As banking services are in the nature of a public good, it is essential that the availability of banking and payment services should be made available to the entire population without discrimination and that this should be the prime objective of our public policies to move from financial access to financial deepening. I once again thank the organizers for this opportunity given to me for the selection of this very important theme and I also like to thank the camera uh, service provider who's, who's, who's been straining his arm and the young lady who has come to my office and your entire team who has helped me to be present with you, though not in real time, but to share my thoughts, ideas, concerns, and all these matters with you today. I thank this very good audience for a very, very patient listening. Thank you once again for having me, and I do hope that we are all able to renew our commitment to go from financial access to financial deepening. Thank you.